Hey, Tori, if you look at the, um, don't talk back to me right now, but if you look at Facebook and YouTube on the church's website, you should see this, the wide shot of the church streaming there by now. I just hit the go button for streaming. Yep. I'm going to leave um, one here. Let's, get, let's text okay, from now on. And let's get this lit. Hey, Tori, can you, you check Facebook and YouTube to make sure that the streams are live there now? <laughs> so, yeah. If you just so, light this. So am I saying the word tongue gamer? No. So get him started and then step over and do it and then step up. All right. It's okay. Whatever you prefer. What make, what's going to flow? Well, no, I think people, not, so one people would not know the word. So I think having someone say the word. So I'm gonna turn this mic off, Tori, because people on the stream can hear me. I think, yeah, they can. Um, so we're texting from now on. Okay, thanks for all the help setting up. Appreciate it.
Please prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. To be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. To be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary.
Good morning and welcome. <clears throat> I'm the Reverend Kirsten Homblet Allen. I'm an affiliated minister here at the First Unitarian Church of Orlando. It's my honor to welcome you to our church for this celebration of life. Whether you're attending this morning in person or online, we are glad that you are here. For those of you here in person this morning, I also invite you to stay after the service for a reception in Gore Hall, which is just across the patio through these glass doors. Our congregation is a Unitarian Universalist congregation. Our faith tradition involves an open-ended search for meaning and a commitment to asking our values to shape our actions. We come together for celebration and worship, education and support. Though we have no formal creed or required statement of belief, there are nonetheless things that we share. We believe in the dignity of all beings, the full use of reason, the value of all religious traditions, the principles of love and compassion, the never-ending search for truth by free minds, and the importance of human community. We welcome all, whatever race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexual orientation, or religious background into this beloved community. I know that Victoria resonated with these values, and we are honored to have been chosen to host this celebration of life for her. Let us begin. A human life is sacred. It is sacred in its being born, it is sacred in its living, and it is sacred in its dying. We are gathered here this morning by death, by the end of a wonderful woman's life, the life of Victoria Goddard. Though we will mourn, for mourn we must, by her own request and the desires of her family, let this be a time for remembering the beauty of the person she was, a time for celebrating her and honoring her life. How true are the words of Khalil Gibran who wrote, when you are sorrowful, look again in your heart and you, you shall see that in truth, you are weeping for that which has been your delight. Such is the paradox of human life. When we open our hearts to one another, to deeply love and delight in one another in the face of our own mortality. And so we are gathered here today in life's embrace to comfort one another, to celebrate Victoria, and to delight in stories about the incredible life she led that had an impact on so many. It is fitting that we celebrate her life in this particular space where her vision, care, and love has had such an impact. Her imagination as project manager in the renovation of this church campus has touched every corner of the space, and her thoughtfulness infuses it. On Sunday mornings, my own small children play back there in our wiggle room on a soft, beautiful rug that she chose for the space itself. Our community has been blessed to have benefited from Victoria's life work. So many communities are blessed to have been touched by Victoria. May the spirit of healing and a sense of joy move among us as we pay tribute to her and as we show our love and support to her friends and family, especially her husband, Paul, and her children, and the many other family members and friends who are like family with us here this morning. Today, we affirm the power of memory and love and celebrate the life of a beloved mother, wife, sister, coach, mentor, and friend, a beloved human.
Good morning. My name is Dan Homlet, and I was uh, privileged to be part of two teams that worked on the renovation of this campus. First, our building the dream team, and finally, completing the dream. So over a six-year period, we worked very closely with M. Paul, and particularly Victoria, to take a campus that was built in the 50s and 60s and turn it into what it is today. So I just want to tell two very brief stories to kind of get context relative to being in this space. When we put out a scope of work for the project, we included in that that we wanted to eliminate one of the driveways into our campus. And as we were interacting with contractors and they were walking the site, it was like, you want to get rid of a driveway? And we had a good reason for that, because it split our campus in two, and generally speaking, the elderly component of our congregation lived in these spaces and the children lived on the other side of the driveway. But in the midst of that, Victoria chose to come here with her kids one Sunday and walk back and forth between those spaces. And in her mind, she saw exactly what our concerns were. Not only was the driveway a physical barrier and a problem for kids running back and forth, but it was also a barrier in the sense of some people that stayed here never went to that space and vice versa. So as part of the project and w working with the team, um, they rethought what we considered children's RE and it became the enrichment center where members of all generations participate and meet in that space. Um, and we got rid of that driveway. And then there was like, what are we gonna do with this space amongst those three beautiful live oaks? And so with a little more brainstorming and dreaming and uh, asking lots of questions, she came up with, along with our team, the concept of building a labyrinth in that area. And so that isn't an easy thing because, you know, you just, ah, let's throw some bricks or pavers down. It isn't that easy, especially if you want it to have meaning to us and anybody that uses that space. So she found someone that actually builds a kit of a labyrinth and they send it here on pallets and then you have a local contractor or subcontractor assemble it. And that's what's happened. So I hope that after the service, you'll take a moment and walk that space. And here's the last thing that I'll say. Sorry. During one of our every two week meetings to talk about paint chips and all sorts of other things, she said, let's take a break. And uh, she had some crystals. So we went over in that space and we placed the crystals under the labyrinth. So there always will be part of Victoria in that space that's welcoming for us as a church and you as a community. So I know that she spent time there and I hope today or sometime in the future you will as well. So with that said, let's move on with the service. Um, the flaming chalice is a symbol of Unitarian Universalism. When we light the chalice in worship, we illuminate a world that we are called upon to serve with love and justice. Lighting the chalice also signals the entry of the gathered community into a sacred place and time. The words on the screen above me are the chalice lighting words that our congregation says together every week. As we begin our time of worship, please join me in reading them together as Reverend Kirsten lights the chalice. In the light of truth and the warmth of love, we gather to seek, to sustain, and to share. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Jew Goddard. <clears throat> I'm reading When Death Comes by Mary Oliver. When death comes like a hungry bear in autumn, when death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut, when death comes like the measle pox, when death comes like an iceberg between the, um, between the shoulder blades. I want to step through the door full of curiosity, 
wondering, what is it going to be like, that cottage of darkness? And therefore, I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And I look upon time as no more than an idea. And I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each life as a flower, as a common as a field daisy, and as singular in each name a comfortable music in the mouth, tending, as all music does, towards silence. And each body a line of courage and something precious to earth. When it's over, I want to say all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was a bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> you want to say anything? No? This is Ava True Goddard, my sister. Thank you all so much for gathering here today. <clears throat> we appreciate everyone coming to help us celebrate the life of my sister, Jessica's aunt, Victoria Summerfield Goddard. It's easy to see from all the people that showed up this morning to honor Victoria that she had a big, full, beautiful life. And to try to hit the highlights of her whole life in 10 minutes or less, <clears throat> it's an almost impossible task. But we're going to do the best that we can to give you a visual of who Victoria was. Victoria is the fourth of five siblings. She's about 20 months older than me, so she was naturally my first and longest best friend. We're the youngest of the five siblings, so we were forced or had the joy, whatever way you look at it, of sharing a bedroom until she left me to go to college. This closeness created a bond that lasted our whole lives. I was a somewhat shy child, and Victoria was my very confident, capable older sister and protector. As we grew older, our relationship grew and changed a bit, and although she was always my big sister, we became each other's person, each other's sounding board during conflicts, support during troubled times, and biggest cheerleaders during triumphs. I consider myself incredibly lucky to have had Victoria in my corner. Our dad spent 24 years serving in the Navy, so much of our childhood was spent moving around the world. <clears throat> this created a very tight and loving family unit, but not without some heartbreak, conflicts, or turbulence as I imagine is the case with most families. One of the most special places that we were stationed during this military life was Rota, Spain. Every sibling would agree that Spain was by far our favorite base that my dad was assigned to. From Spain, we moved, we moved to Northern Virginia where Victoria spent most of her middle and high school years. Some very important things happened during this time. Well, in high school, she was first introduced to rowing. <coughs> It was a new sport to her, a new program for the school, and the start of a lifelong love. As with everything she tried in life, she jumped in wholeheartedly. I was fortunate enough to have her drag me along when I entered high school a couple of years later. Victoria's rowing timeline is full of substantial accomplishments at the high school level in Northern Virginia, the college level at the University of Central Florida, where she was a Dadville national champion, and then training for the USA national team until an injury and a sweet baby boy altered that journey. <laughs> she later experienced a tremendous amount of success as a rowing coach at both the high school level and back at UCF at the college level. Rowing was a huge part of Victoria's life and she received so much from the rowing community as a rower and then turned around and gave so much back as a coach. Another life-changing opportunity for Victoria happened during her junior year in high school. Victoria was selected to attend a brand new magnet high school for her senior year. Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology opened in the fall of 1985, and it was a unique design with the idea to establish a partnership among businesses and schools created to improve education in science, mathematics, and technology. 
representatives from the top businesses and industries in the area, as well as the staff of the Fairfax County Public Schools, work together in curriculum and facilities development for the school. I always knew my sister was smart, but this was the first time that I realized that she was smart smart. <laughs> she was asked to attend this inaugural class out of all the incoming seniors in Virginia at the time. This would be a huge commitment academically for what they were going to expect from her. Victoria jumped at the offer and accepted the challenge. Even though she would have to drive an hour each way in Washington, D.C. rush hour traffic in order to take advantage of this opportunity. Attending school with the best of the best really opened her eyes to what she was capable of, and she started envisioning all the possibilities of what she could accomplish in her life. I tell you all this because the school has gone on to become the number one school in the nation. Number one. Victoria was incredibly smart. There was never a moment in her life when she wasn't pushing herself, not just to persevere, but to learn more, improve, and grow mentally, physically, and spiritually. If you want a brilliant woman at the helm, Victoria Summerfield Goddard, CFO, was it. She was our captain. Victoria's keen sense of business and ability to integrate a dream into a vision into a multi-million dollar general contracting firm was astonishing. It was even more fun to be a part of. Victoria worked tirelessly to build a solid reputation that would withstand years to come. She valued a dollar and always made sure they were in the right corner. Bean counting, I think it was her sixth sense. She was fierce and kind, all in the same breath. She excelled at budgets, contracts, and never missed a beat in this male-driven construction industry. She did it all with such accuracy and great intention. Intentional was a belief she quickly built for herself. In all things business and in business building, Victoria valued a handshake, a zero punchless item project, <laughs> a good well thought out process, and the huge responsibility of tending to the risk and money management of each project and Paul completed. She established business core values outside of the traditional norms, be effective, be responsive, and be a good human. She knew it possible, even in the contracting world, that we could be different, that our core values would gravitate to the people and projects we wanted to be a part of. I was fortunate enough to have the front row seat, to soak up every bit of knowledge I could. I watched Victoria conduct business in, in ways I'd never experienced. <clears throat> she thought out every possible scenario and had the contingency plan to the contingency plan. The value she brought to each conversation was incredible. You couldn't help but want to ask her all the questions all the time because she had all the answers and you wished for a tenth of the knowledge. Her drive was contagious and you could never catch it. She was always pursuing, pushing, driving it forward while looking back to make sure we were all in line. The small details mattered, always. It was in those details that she found the magic, the feel good in business, the connection, the people, the growth, and the heart of what M. Paul meant, not only to her, but the legacy she had created. We often spoke about the work we were doing and about what legacy, what our legacy would look like years down the road. She reminded me that the legacy is built in the small details, the small moments. Those small pieces were building the real legacy of who we were, and the story would be told through many generations. Her legacy has been woven into the fabric of Impal and the project she completed. It is in the heartbeat of the company and the community she so loved. <clears throat> Victoria had many amazing accomplishments as a student, an athlete, and a businesswoman. But what she was most proud of, and what meant more to her than anything else in the world, was mothering her four precious children. Victoria was fairly young when she first became a mom, but she was more than ready to welcome a little baby girl. Tori was her absolute world, and Tori had her mama to herself for almost nine full years. In a sense, they grew up together, <clears throat> mother and daughter, navigating life in the best possible way. Tori had her world rocked when at 32, Victoria gave birth to her first beautiful boy. After a run of nine granddaughters on our side of the family, <clears throat> the streak was broken when Caleb came into the world. He forged his path as best he could with these eight girl cousins and one big sister, bossing him around at every opportunity. 
Victoria really wanted a big family, and six years after Caleb, she was blessed with another precious boy. As most of us moms know, we are different mothers to each of our children, depending on what each child needs and where we are in our life at the time. Although Victoria was still working and building her and Paul's business when she was pregnant with Jude, she wanted to do things a little different, a little slower, and be a little more present. Jude came into this world at Lake Pickett, surrounded by family, and with so much love present. After Jude, I think Victoria, or at least Paul, thought that their family might be complete. But a little, a little over three years later, a magical little baby girl, Ava True, surprised everyone and made them a family of six. I could talk for hours about these four amazing humans and share special stories of them and their mama. Tori giving her mommy the treatment when she was left with her aunt's or grandma. Caleb as the most adorable ring bearer for his mom and dad's wedding. Proud moments like taking Jude to a speech competition, watching Ava shine on the back of a horse. Memories of lake days, beach walks, seashell and sea glass hunting, game nights, flag football, volleyball games, Thanksgiving meals, Christmas Eve parties, Easter egg hunts, bonfires, or just quiet snuggles and talks about life. She loved them, she nourished them, she taught them, she nurtured them, she encouraged them and she guided them and soaked in every minute of time with each of them. The most difficult part of her being sick was facing the fact that she was going to physically leave them. <clears throat> Victoria's lifetime of learning, growing, and training as an Olympic athlete all came into play in how she fought her last fight. When she was diagnosed, she researched things more complex and advanced than some oncologists and doctors were even knowledgeable on. She showed more will and mental strength trying to keep her body physically viable than many professional athletes. She fought, she prayed, she kept going, she persevered longer <clears throat> than what seemed humanly possible. Until the day she died, she decided she was going to take a different path. This was an unbearable decision for her, not for herself, but for the people that she would leave behind, her friends, her family, her husband, but mostly her children. She knew that those four precious souls that she was given to mother would have different lives after losing their mom. They are each incredible, unique, magical humans who have all the tools to go on and have amazing, wonderful lives. But those lives, and all of our lives, will most definitely be different without Victoria in it. From the moment Victoria made the decision to cease all medical treatment, she was immediately engulfed in the most mystical clarity and spirituality that she so generously shared with anyone that was lucky enough to be around her. And without going into too many details, as with everything in her life, Victoria took her last breaths exactly how she wanted, on her own terms. She quietly and peacefully slipped away during the most beautiful sunrise, and she stepped into the unknown with a full heart, arms open wide, ready to greet her helpers, her ancestors, the angels, her Jesus, her God.
love you, Mom. I love you, Mom. You're so beautiful, Mom. You're so beautiful, Mom. That, that was me and Ava. My name is Tom Monty. I am honored to speak about my friendship with Victoria Goddard. I first met Victoria in 2007. She had suffered a health crisis and she and Paul visited me in Massachusetts for guidance on the macrobiotic diet. The following year, 2008, Victoria and Paul attended a weekend workshop I did on marriage and intimate partnerships in Northampton, Massachusetts. During one of the breaks in the program, Victoria told my wife, Toby, that this is way out of my comfort zone. I'm not sure I'm gonna make it through the weekend. Not only did she make it through the weekend, but she attended my healing programs faithfully for the next 11 years. Over that time, I mentored her through many different challenges and came to know her as one of the kindest, wisest, and most loving human beings I've ever met. During the last two years of her life, as she battled cancer, I spoke to her every week, oftentimes multiple times per week. The two things that Victoria loved above all else were family and her relentless search for truth. Above all, she loved her family. I truly believe that her love for Paul and her children was what fueled her search for truth. She wanted to be absolutely the most loving and wisest mother and wife she could be. She was a lioness when it came to protecting her family and celebrating her children, as those photographs clearly demonstrate. She was their mother protector, their cheerleader, their tutor, and their example for a human being who was loving, compassionate, understanding, hardworking, constantly learning and constantly evolving. Whenever I asked her about her kids, she would light up and give me the latest report on Caleb's water polo, his academics, how she reveled in watching him grow into a strong and good man. Jude's love of nature, fishing, surfing, basketball, his natural grace, Ava's kind and loving heart, her beauty and brilliant and creative mind, her great sensitivity, Ava's kind and loving heart, her beauty, and brilliant and creative mind, her wisdom, her insight into people and her emergence as a mature, strong and beautiful woman. Nothing gave Victoria more joy than ins an inspiration to work on herself and the love she had for Paul and her children. Victoria was a person of immense and varied talents. She was an elite college athlete, a champion rower, she was a coach and mentor to many young athletes. She was a great businesswoman, as we've heard attested to already. The CFO of a successful construction company that she and Paul had created and ran, a visionary businesswoman, as this church attests. She could see possibilities and projects and make them a reality. She was also a natural healer. She was highly empathetic and immensely generous and full of insight she wanted to help everyone, to show people how to live a healthier, happier, and more fulfilled life. Victoria was a born healer and helper to anyone who came into her circle. For 11 years, Victoria would fly from Florida to New York or New York City or Massachusetts, wherever I was giving healing programs. And oftentimes she would come monthly for eight months at a stretch. She had an immense hunger to learn everything she could about health, healing, relationship, love, ancient wisdom, science, and spirituality. She wanted to help people, but she was also a very private person. In the Healers program, we used to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one sharing, in which each person would, have, would take 10 minutes to talk about a particular challenge in his or her life and receive support from the other. Invariably, Victoria would devote the entire 20 minutes of segment to allowing the other person to speak about whatever he or she was struggling with and then coach her or him with love, empathy, and insight. She wanted to uplift people. She saw the good in people and wanted to grow it. That is the nature of love. And Victoria was full of love. 
In all the years I knew her, she never gossiped or spoke ill of anyone. She had a kind word for everyone she met. She was immensely courageous. When she faced sickness and ultimately death, she did so with the same courage and strength and grace with which she lived. She was constantly searching for a deeper truth, a cure, yes, but also the meaning of what she was going through. At the end of her life, just two weeks before her death, she had an immense revelation that she shared with me in one of our Zoom calls. She poured out her heart. She had broken through into the bright light of insight. She saw with intense clarity the themes that she had struggled with in life. She saw meaning in it all. She spoke about the love she had for her children and Paul and how grateful she was for her life. She spoke about what held her back in life. So much that she had not understood before, she understood now. It was a moment of profound love, truth, and grace, and she saw beauty in it all. It was as if all the hard work she had done in her life had yielded its truth, its truths, and she poured out all of it in her vision, like a life-giving fountain of truth, compassion, and love. I felt overwhelmed and blessed to be in her presence. It was the last coherent conversation we had. After that, she could not speak very much, and my calls were just to be with her and Paul, and to let Paul relate how things were going. Victoria blessed us all with her love and her support for our lives. Words that come to mind when I think of Victoria include strong, highly intelligent, immensely talented, immensely loving, utterly supportive of others, kind, compassionate, empathetic, beautiful. You can't think of Victoria without seeing that immense head of hair and that big, beautiful, joyful smile. She was humble. She was utterly lacking in anything false. She was private. Victoria rarely talked about herself unless she was sharing with me some difficulty she was dealing with. She was committed to truth. She would never let her ego stand in the way of, any, of understanding something that about herself or about life that might be causing her pain or causing pain to someone else. Yes, like all of us, she had sadness, frustration, and anger. She suffered disappointments. But she used those feelings to fuel her search for answers. Her pain became the source of her, of her search, became the fuel for her reunion with God. If there was one thing I feel about Victoria's journey, it is that her, she used her precious time on earth pursuing the most important things in life. Love, compassion, understanding, wisdom, solutions to suffering. This is the example she left us. This is her legacy. And we're all blessed for having her in our lives. Thank you, Victoria. Hello, everyone. My name is Kristen Larson. I'm being joined with Coach Jana and one of my teammates, Selena Burden. Um, I'm a director of a rowing program, and I owe that to Vicki. I actually brought up a grad project that I did in 2013, just using it to help me, because she's in it. Um, my heroes have always been coaches. And that's why I wanted to begin by saying what I do. She really affected who I am. And uh, I just wanted to tell a few stories of how unbelievably incredible and giving she was as a coach. So we're going to start with head of the Chattahoochee in Tennessee. I was in a boat. We cut a corner too short. And we ripped the skeg of the boat off and we began to sink. <laughs> Pretty close to the finish line, too. So she could see us across the way. Brand new boat. We pull off to the side. It's cold, it's November. We're swimming, we go off to the side, we have to wait till the end of the day 
to be rescued. <laughs> and we're sitting there, there are five of us, and we're like, okay, it's a new boat, pretty expensive. Is she gonna be mad? We're sitting there and we had a bet going. I bet when she comes over to rescue us, she's gonna laugh. Boat's approaching, we're all sitting there shivering, and she looks at us and smiles and has to look away, and we're like, yes! <laughs> we knew it, we knew it. So my point of this is that she always gave people space to make mistakes, mistakes, excuse me. She gave grace in that, and I think that's something that I've taken as an adult, and you have to give, especially the youth, that opportunity to make those mistakes because that's how we grow. And that's something that I've taken with me ever since. So my second rowing story is actually with Caleb. So this was 2000, 2001. Vicky always wore these brown overalls that were shorts and she is nine months pregnant. And she's coaching us and all of a sudden she's, ooh, and we're in the boat, are you, are you okay? Is everything okay? Everything's fine, all is good. Continues to coach us, probably 30, 40 minutes. We pull up with the boat, we're getting out, she gets out of the coaching boat, and her water has broke. <laughs> we're all college girls. Oh my gosh, what do you need? She was more embarrassed about the water break than anything, I got it guys. It's all good. Just put the boat away. I'll see you later. Can we drive you? What do you need from us? I got it. It's good. My point is she made everything that should be hard seem easy. Seem. <laughs> she did everything with such grace and poise that you just felt safe. You felt good. She taught so many lessons on how to be fierce and to us women, how to be feminine and fierce together, and that can be something unbelievable. I'm a director of a rowing program. I would not be standing in front of you right now without this person. She gave me a community, hundreds of people. She has affected me in so many ways. And so what I wanna say is that after coaching, 12, 13 years pass, and she comes back into my life. Lightning has struck twice in the same place. I can't believe it. Vicki is coming back to my life after college. I'm coaching at UCF at my alma mater. And she asked me, hi, remember that child that I had back then? Would you mind teaching him some Spanish? In return, I can teach you about macrobiotics. I can teach you some other lessons about life and I jumped at the opportunity to be invited back into this incredible family that has given me so much. And uh, I'm not the most organized human, but I actually, on my email um, box, I have Victoria as a, what am I thinking, like a, um, as a folder, thank you. <laughs> and I saved any email that we corresponded because we would have Soul chats, that's what we would discuss. After we would uh, work some Spanish with Caleb, um, actually got him out in a boat, and got him rowing, which was so fun. Um, we would just sit and discuss big things, big life things. And she taught me this unbelie unbelievable lesson, and that's what I wrote about in here. So I, I did a project, and it said, who helped define you? Who helped find you? And I put her, and I'm not gonna read it, except for, sorry. The lesson she taught me, speak your truth, live your truth. The people that align with the same values and love will find you if you're living your truth. Wow, that was so profound. Like, yes, 100%. And I have taken that with me. That's how I coach. It's not just about the sport. It's about teaching life lessons. It's about community. It's about loving each other and building relationships. And that is what she taught me. Thank you.
We are Victoria's nieces and nephews. Um, we are going to be reading a poem called Death is Nothing at All. Death is nothing at all. It does not count. I have only slipped away into the next room. Nothing has happened. Everything remains exactly as it was. I am I, and you are you. And the old life that we live so fondly together is untouched, unchanged. Whatever we were to each other, that we are still. Call me by the old familiar name. Speak of me in the easy way which you always use. Put no difference into your tone. Wear no forced air of solemnity or sorrow. Laugh as we always laughed at the little jokes that we enjoyed together. Play, smile, think of me, pray for me. Let my name be ever the household word that it always was. Let it be spoken without an effort, without the ghost of a shadow upon it. Life means all that it has ever meant. It is the same as it ever was. There is absolute and unbroken continuity. What is death but an equitable accident? Why should I be out of mind because I am out of sight? I am but waiting for you for an interval, somewhere very near, just round the corner. All is well, nothing is hurt, nothing is lost. One brief moment, and all will be as it was before. How we shall laugh at the trouble of parting when we meet again. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah, doing good? Um, so I see here um, my sister's following me up, which is when we were at her funeral, that's, that's what happened. I made sure I was before her, because she's a, she's a pretty good writer. I don't, I don't, I don't want to follow that act, but uh, <laughs> before, I, before I start talking about my mom, I want to thank a couple people. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to thank my Aunt Tina, um, my Aunt Teresa, my sister, and my, my dad for uh, in the two months when my mom was passing. The, they were with her all day. There was somebody with her all day and all night, and there was somebody by her side, so I'd like to thank all of those people, and it really means a lot to me. Um, I'd like to thank my little brother uh, for continu continuously checking on me, um, more than I check on him, which I know isn't good, but, uh, and, my, and my whole family, but specifically my brother. Um, I'd like to thank Lance Smith for uh, stopping by the house after my mom passed to uh, apologize for uh, her loss of life, and it meant a lot more to me than I think he realized. Um, I'd like to thank his son, Connor Smith, for being my best friend in the whole world, giving me a shoulder to lean on when I need it. Um, <laughs> I want to thank all my moms that are here. I got a lot of moms here, um, and I, I need all of you, and I appreciate all of you um, just for supporting me through all of this. Oh, let's see. Oh, and lastly, uh, thank you all for being here. So many people showed up that I just, I, I, you know, I didn't know who was coming. I didn't really invite anybody. If I, if I invited somebody, I almost felt like I was burdening them. And I know that's not really, that's not really how that works. But if I, if I, if I asked you to come to my mom's memorial, you're coming. Or, <laughs> right? You're, you know, that'd be a weird one to be like, I'll pass. So, but, uh, no, so I really appreciate everybody being here. Um, I, I didn't think my mom was going to die. Uh, not for a second. Uh, not when I came home my freshman year from college after she got diagnosed. Uh, it scared me a little bit, that's why I came home, but uh, I mean, you, you heard Kristen and my uh, aunt and my cousin talk about her. She had anything she wanted to do, she did it. And she was, I mean, she was healthy as a whore. I mean, she, she, she could do anything. And she taught me I could do anything I wanted, but man, she really could do anything. And uh, up until, um, I, I was in Barcelona, I got called home from Barcelona just because she wasn't doing too great, but even then I had no doubts in my mind because she, she was still fighting her ass off. She was, there, there was no loss of hope in me, right? And I was pressure washing for uh, uh, one of my, my dad's friends and I got a call pressure washing and, she, and it was my dad and he said, you gotta come home. And she was, uh, sh I don't like to say giving up because she really, I mean, which is technically what it was, but uh, she, she was just too much for her, right? And that's the first time I even had an inkling that she might pass. And still then, I mean, 50% of me is still, she'll be fine. And I think that's what helped me get through a lot of it. But up until that point, I was, to not, I swear to God, not 1% of me was even thinking she was going to pass away. But, uh, um, this was a really hard thing to write for. I, 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 have, some, I have some notes, and I, I actually did write some big, long thing, but I, I didn't want to just kind of read something off a piece of paper for you guys. I just want to talk to you guys. Everybody in this room is my family. Um, but I, I kept making it about myself, <laughs> about you know, my new job, me not having my uh, mom to talk to. And I went to, I went to mop the place I'm living in now, and I called my mom on how to mop because I don't know how to mop, and I used way too much soap, so I had to mop it again with some water. Um, but uh, you guys don't, I don't need to explain to you how perfect and amazing she was, because first of all, uh, everybody that's spoken has done an amazing job of just describing how perfect she was, but you all are here because you knew her, and you met her, and you, you know how amazing she was, and perfect. And I hate calling people perfect, because nobody's perfect, but she was perfect. She was perfect, she was kind, she was, she was an athlete, she did everything. She was, my, uh, she was my teacher, she was my best friend, my favorite person to talk to. I, I just miss her, right? And I keep getting advice from people, and it's horrible advice. It's, <laughs> it's you know, it's, it's, it never goes away, uh, but, but it, get, it gets better, right? Um, but I, I don't even want it to get better. And I know it's never going to go away, but I don't want it to get better because I, I don't want to stop missing my mom. She was so important to me. Man, I would do this every week with you guys and have a conversation with her. And that's, that's what I was, 
you know, I didn't, my dad was getting on me for about three weeks just for preparing for this. And uh, I knew I wasn't going to, but uh, um, he, was, he, was, he was getting on me about it. But I, I think about it every day, and I talk about it every chance I get, and I thought about it for three weeks. And so I was talking to Connor yesterday. We were hanging out, and I, I told him, I was like, I was like hey, and I, you know how I said I didn't want to invite anybody. I was, this is me inviting Connor. I was like, hey, you know, I got this uh, thing, this, like, you know, like this little memorial event for my mom tomorrow morning, and I'm like, I haven't written anything for it. And Connor goes, you haven't written anything for it? And I was like... It's like, all right, I guess I should probably put a couple of notes down. But uh, he's like, yeah, me and my whole family are going, because obviously they were all going. But it, uh, no, it, again, it means a lot to me that you all are here. But uh, I'm going to keep talking. My, my, I asked my dad, I said, how long can I take? And he said, he said you got five minutes. I said, I said, so if I stand up there for 15 minutes, you see somebody's going to walk up there and say, you got to go, because I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> so... Uh, Um, everybody in this room she spoke very highly of and she rarely spoke in a negative connotation towards anybody um, and I think that's because she taught me that there was really no bad people and of course I'm sure there's some evil in the world but there's, there's not really bad people P people are angry sometimes and uh, people have hatred inside of them. People are jealous, but there, there's no bad people. And I was really hard on my mom growing up, and I was, uh, and my mom was only patient with me always. And uh, that's that's taught me to treat people like that. That's in whatever aspect of your life, right? You're you're gonna you're gonna get what you're putting out. So. Um, Everybody in this room, I wanted to honestly write a little something about literally everybody, about Jessica, about Tim, who, uh, Tim, real quick, Tim doesn't know this, Jessica's husband, uh, he says jump, and I'll say how high, and me and Tim aren't real close like that, but because of how highly my mom spoke of him, and uh, at his wedding with uh, Jessica, you should see him, he's crying more than me, and talk, <laughs> talking about... Uh, talking about Sebastian and Oliver, but uh, no, I could talk about everybody in this room, about Logan, about, uh, about Carson, about, about everybody in this room, because um, she saw the absolute best in any, everybody. Um, um, I invited some of my friends uh, here today, and I needed to let them know and let everybody know. I, I miss her more than anything in the world. And I miss her more than my dad, and I miss her more than my brother, and I promise I do. Um, I get into my car wherever I am, whether I'm leaving a sales call, I'm leaving a friend's house, I'm leaving wherever, and I just start crying. Because I, I can't believe it. I, I, leave, I leave the gym, and bef uh, before, I would, I would call my mom after the gym every day. Yeah, I just swam for 45 minutes, and I, and I did this, I did this. She would just listen and listen, and she's like, she's like, okay, is that it? I'm like, yeah, and I would just tell her, and she'd listen, and that was all it was. It wasn't anything special, but I, I, I would tell my mom absolutely everything I would do because I always wanted her input, and I always, because it was, my, my mom had a really bad habit of always being right, so, uh, <laughs> um, and it was fun when she was wrong, because when she was wrong, it was just, she, I mean, she brushed it off real quick. She acknowledged it, of course, of course. She was, she was better than anybody else, because that's also what she taught me. It's just because it's not, it's not real easy to be wrong, but it's, but it's good to be wrong, because then you can be right next time. But no, she, she'd be wrong. She'd, she'd brush it off. She's like, yeah, okay, you're right. Anyways, let's continue. So, so. <sighs> I've never, I've never been this sad. I, uh, of course, I've been sad over things, and what what I think I do is I just, uh, I'll try to block it out a little bit, right? How people will tell you like things things don't get better, but but they they, they get a little better, so I'll, I'll block it out. But when I really think about, it, I really just want to talk to my mom. I, I can't contain myself. 
an example of that, and this is one of my favorite moments from that day of her funeral. Me and my little brother were driving up to Gainesville, and it was just us two. And we were having a ball, man. We were playing country music. We were playing rock music. We were, we were just jamming, smiles on our face, having a ball. We're probably an hour, 15 minutes into the drive, right? And he, I don't know if it was an accident, whatever it was, he plays one just kind of sad song, right? Because we were in this upbeat mood. And man, I don't think we said another word the whole drive there because we were just, just right here, just, just driving all the way there. But, uh, but no, I, I'll have a tendency to kind of just, just block it out. And, uh, and I, I don't want to do that. That's why I said that was bad advice. I, I can't stop thinking about my mom. And uh, I really, really, really appreciate absolutely everybody that came out here today. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up. But what I did at the funeral was I wrapped it up and I, I sat back down. And I thought of a million more things to say. Because I, I really can talk about it for hours. Because I can tell so many stories. And I, just, I just want everybody to know how hurting I am. So I'm sorry if I'm maybe not texting some of my family members back. I'm sorry. And uh, I just, just anything, just give me a break because I'm, I'm really hurt right now more than I've ever had in my whole life. But it means so much to me just seeing, just, man, Chuck Taylor showed up. I called Chuck the other day. He was at, a, he was at another construction business because my new job selling construction material. And he's like, he's like, Caleb? I'm like, yeah, we just had a great conversation. I saw him here and it, I lit up my... Uh, one of my ex-girlfriends father's here. I didn't, I, he doesn't know this. I didn't recognize him at first when he, when he came up. But he said her name, and I immediately I knew who he was. But that, it, it means so much to me that just all of you showed up. And I know all of you showed up because my mom was so amazing. She was so perfect. And that's it. I love you all. I love every single one of you. Thank you so much for coming. That was it. Caleb said he didn't want to follow me, but I'm, I think it's the reverse, if I'm honest. Um, I'm, Victor um, I'm Victoria's oldest child, Tori. I almost introduced myself as Victoria, which is also accurate, so there we are. Um, someone in the chat on Zoom has written that they're weeping, and yes, same, so excuse me if I need to collect myself for a moment. Um, I'm so sorry that I am not able to be there in person today. Um, it's an honor to be able to speak over this platform and get to share my piece of my mom with you guys. It's an honor to be able to hear the different pieces from everybody else today as well. And I say a piece, um, but really I, I wish I could share everything about her. Um, I could speak forever about my mother. I could tell you about her magic and her faith and her love for her children. And the way that she was almost magnetized when she'd enter a room. It was like you had to know her. Um, you had to be near her. You had to be in her space. And there was something about the way she could see you and that she could honor you for your truest self, even if you weren't aware of those pieces yourself. And this was no matter who you were. I could speak about her strength and her wisdom and her joy and her connection to this thing that's bigger than all of us and she and her love for that. And I do want to say everything, but I also feel completely unable to say anything because I still don't understand how we're here. Because she wasn't supposed to die. My strong, young mother with her ancient soul, every cell in my being keeps telling me that she wasn't supposed to die. Towards the end, I probably more, um, more and more towards the end, I, I 
brought that up to her directly and we'd chat about it and she would smile and her soul would gently compose this new melody or old melody for my heart to take on because she understood that I understood that we already did this. We walked her death and the mystery and the seasons and our connection to the universe and our connection to each other a thousand times over already. I want to say everything, but I can't say everything today because we're all talking far more than we're meant to. Um, but there are more words that I would like to share. Um, I wrote this poem for my mom sometime in August last year about the suffering and the ambiguous grief and the mystery and the daily practice of surrender. And it was daily, it was from minute to minute sometimes. And the, the poem's called Maybe. Maybe if I clasp my hands very, very tight, and if I jump the cracks and always remember to tap my knuckles to a tree, find a shooting star, make a wish, never set it free. Maybe if this time I hold my breath in every tunnel, trade in all 29 candles for a sliver of a deal, mix with rabbit's feet and promise, promise, promise to heal my own heart, my own story, and if I never let you hang up the phone, maybe then I could go back to pink dresses and big curls. Maybe then, little Tori, maybe she could pause time, become a photograph, forever study the hands that loved me first, forever ready to start the day, the life. It surely wouldn't be the worst. You gently correct my button and my tag, tuck my hair behind an ear. Oh, my sweet girl, your charms are perfect. And still, 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 there is nothing wrong here. She was not supposed to die. I can say this again and again, but at the end of the day, it's insincere. I can't mean those words when I say them because the depths that she and I would venture to together and that she would venture to with all of you, I know you know what I'm talking about, don't allow for it. I know my mother loved this life, and I'm not sure she had to. I know her enthusiasm could find its way under your skin and into your heart, and I know her love was infinite. Being my mother was the most important thing. Being Caleb's mother was the most important thing. Being Jude's mother was the most important thing. Being Ava's mother was the most important thing. <sighs> Being your sister, your coach, your friend, your inspiration, your true love, these were the most important things. All at once, all at the same time, and somehow she did this effortlessly, as many have noted today. My heart is broken and it's aching. And nearly eight months after her death, there are still times when I move to breathe only to find that my lungs have given way because she wasn't supposed to die. And yet, when I feel her again, not the memory of her, 
but her true spirit that lives within me. My mind does calm and my body eases. This is okay, she would say. Set aside your fear. There is nothing wrong here. So much love to everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. thank all of you for being here. I can't tell you how much it means. 
I want to thank everybody that's here and everybody that's online. How much we've appreciated your prayers and your thoughts over the past two years. It's absolutely been felt. I want to thank those that walked closely with us. Walked closely with Victoria, with my family, and with me over the past two years. It's meant a lot. And to those of you that walked very closely with me, and on the days when I needed you, you were always there. And on the days that I could not stand, you propped me up. I thank you. I will be forever grateful. As you all have heard, Victoria was an incredible human being. She was a bit of a control freak. So much so that she has scripted this experience. A couple of years ago, actually quite a few years ago now, she came and said, hey, there's this project downtown. It's a church and they, they want to do this project design build. And what do you think? And I said, well, you know, it's a church, and they've got a board, and they've got a committee, and sometimes they don't have all the funding, and maybe we should, maybe we should think about it. And she said, great, we'll do it. <laughs> so your entire experience today is because of Victoria and the Building the Dream team and the experience that she created here. And she was so giving. I don't think I saw her for a couple of years because she poured herself into this project, absolutely. And that's what she loved to do. She gave of herself and she gave of herself. And she always did it graciously and unselfishly. So she's shaped our experience here today and she's also provided for generations of people to come that are gonna come here and go to the Enrichment Center. So I, it's just, it's funny how she continues to touch our lives in so many ways. Much of who I am today, the man, the husband, the father, the friend, has to do with my relationship with my wife. We were constant companions together through thick and thin. We challenged each other to grow to grow as individuals and to grow as a couple. And I'm so grateful for who I am today because she supported me and she inspired me to be who I am. She's made a difference in everybody's lives who she's come into and she's made a huge difference in my life. In the end, we had a long loving goodbye. We moved back to the beach last May and every day she could, we walked the beach, and we talked and we laughed, still believing she was going to heal. And as her body weakened, her spirit got bigger. The love that she had for everyone around her could be felt in her presence. The last month of her life was hard and beautiful at the same time. During the days, there was a constant semi-circle of people around her. She was holding court. She was imparting knowledge. I said she was woman who spoke truth. And it was a beautiful thing to watch because she had no ego. She really had come to what was true for her and she loved imparting that on others. And she did it in such a loving way it was so warm and so genuine. And that's who she was. She was a student of life and a teacher of living life through your truth. That's what she modeled for me, for the children, and for anybody that ever came in contact with her. In the end, what we learned is there's only love. 
Love is the answer. And if we can calm ourselves and be still, we can find that love in every aspect of our life, no matter what we're going through, no matter what we feel, no matter where we are in life. To many, she was a friend. To her brothers and sisters, she was someone they could seek out to just talk or just to be with. To her children, she was a wonderful, loving, caring, giving, teaching mother. And that was a beautiful thing to watch. To me, she was my best friend, my confidant, my partner, and my beautiful, loving wife. Victoria told me one day on the beach, she stopped. She said, I have to share this with you because I can carry it no longer. And she told me how she wanted this day in this place with all of you. She described it in detail. And sadly, it's better than she described. As I look around the room and I feel into this moment, I can feel her here. I can feel her with me frequently, still giving me guidance. There's a lot of love here. And I thank you all for being here and I thank you all for filling this room with love. I love you, Victoria. I'll see you on the other side. Wow. I, some time ago, my father made me promise to do his funeral. And I still don't know how I'm going to do that. But you all, in your courage, in your honesty, in your openness, in your love for each other, and, the, and all of your large family have shown me that it can be done. Um, I received a phone call at the last month of Victoria's life asking if I might come to do Smyrna Beach to visit with her and her family. And I will never forget that experience. I was able to talk with family around your, the amazing table in your home. And I thought about how so many times Jesus had such meaningful conversations around a table. And there was something powerful that was taking place. But Victoria was in her room, and they let me know she'll be ready, but she's not ready yet. And I was invited to go in, and there I was with Tori and Victoria. And it was one of those amazing experiences. Someone else smarter than me said this first. You go beginning you're going to give to them, only to discover that they have given to you. And I was so deeply blessed with that time. Her, her body was weak, and moving an arm was a a big deal, but her spirit and her heart and her will and her being were so strong. And part of what she had arranged <laughs> was she says, Paul, I want you to speak about what Jesus means to me. And uh, I know that we are here from a lot of different faith traditions, 
And as I learned a little bit about the Universalist Unitarians, I read about the six senses with which you are guided and you seek. And so many of those are, I found in how Victoria spoke about Jesus and Jesus' place in her life. In Jesus, she experienced that transcendent mystery in spirit and presence and of the divine. And she found an affection and a strength as she leaned upon Jesus through these ups and through these downs. She heard and she certainly lived Jesus' radical message of love, of grace, of forgiveness, of justice, of mercy, and of compassion. And even in those difficult times where she was fully living and yet goodbye was a part of life, she discovered that she was surrounded by her family, by her friends, those who were present and those who were apart but she also experienced Jesus' presence, that she was not left alone, that she was being dwelled within rather than just from the side and apart. And she trusted Jesus. She says that she was led to love one another rather than rules of relationships rather than dogma. But she also shared how that was exactly what she discovered in the people of this congregation as she worked with you. I don't think she worked for you. <laughs> but she became part of you, not just because of the work, because of who you as the people of this congregation are. She discovered that she was loved and appreciated and she loved you deeply in return. She was fed and strengthened by your relationships with her as I know you were in her relationships with you all. And I thought that out of a combination of traditions that we might do something that's really important and that is what does all this mean the witness of Victoria's life, the way she's touched ours, the lessons we can learn from that, how to sort out what's really important and what is not, to listen, to speak in our hearts. And what I'd like to do is to offer up to you some questions or comments and to give each of us a moment to think about what that might mean. I know I'm going to use it to think about what it might mean from what I have seen and I have experienced in Victoria and her family. And I invite you to do likewise. Great gratitude for the people like Victoria who live and share and display the meaning of life and of love. That out of that gratitude that we ourselves might grow and mature and discover and explore in ways that we ourselves would bring a similar hope, meaning, and love to others like she did to us. And particularly for those in the midst of dark times.
at gatherings of this type, we are also remembered that we're given but a finite number of days. And at the end of them, as we look back, what insight would we have that we don't have now as to what is worthy to invest ourselves in and what is the junk food? that we might seek and hope, sense, pursue meaning beyond the breaths of our mortal body. that we might find quietness in our lives, that we could hear that still soft voice that speaks, that calls, that leads to healing and to peace, that it might touch us, that we might be the means of sharing and living that for others not just those around us, but for the sake of the world. That in the things that we've heard and experienced today, the one or two things that we're going to commit ourselves to as we leave here. Having been here, having been with Victoria and her family, and reflected upon her life and our own as well, what are those one or two things we're going to commit to do and be different? May we have the courage, the wisdom, the strength, the love, the compassion, the fellowship of one another to live, experience, and generously share this kind of love. Amen. To say these words to extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. In this beautiful space, made more beautiful by the life and memory of Victoria, we've come together, her friends and family, with grief and gratitude to celebrate her life. Let's take a deep breath together. Opening ourselves to the spirit that flows through us all and repeats its rhythms of death and birth, 
loss, and renewal. Feeling the presence of Victoria's spirit in our breath, in our body, in the love surrounding us. May we remember her as she was long ago and as she was just a few short months ago. Her times of strength and her times of need, her moments of joy and her moments of sadness, her teaching, mentoring, mothering, creating, loving. May we remember her for what she was to each of us. Although only a few of us have spoken of her today, each of you comes with your own memories of Victoria, for she was not the same person to any two people here. We bring all of our memories into this common gathering that the pain of losing her may be eased with the balm of love and community. May we feel the blessing of human connection to Victoria and to one another, and may we have the fortitude to honor the gifts of her life, even in our grief. May all present here carry forward Victoria's compassion, her reverence, her courage, and her loving spirit. And may we honor the blessing of Victoria's influence on our lives and cherish always the gifts that came from knowing and loving her. As we close our service, I'm gonna invite you to join in singing this little light of mine as was her wish. The words are gonna be on the screen behind me. And as you sing, I want you to imagine the light that was her carried in each of you, shining brightly. Amen. 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 Tell you something, children. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Yeah, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. I let it shine. Let it shine to show my love. I'm going to tell you that everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. And everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Yeah, everywhere I go, I'm going to. Let it shine, I let it shine, I let it shine to show my love. I got to tell you that even in my home, I'm gonna let it shine. And even in my home, I'm gonna let it shine, yeah. Even in I let it shine, I let it shine to show my love. I got to tell you that when I see my neighbor coming, I'm gonna let it shine. Ha. I think I see my neighbor coming. I better let it shine. Yeah, when I see my neighbor coming. I'm gonna let it shine, I let it shine, I let it shine to show my love. How I like to say amen, amen, amen. amen. I 
wonder would everybody join me on the last chorus. Everybody, hey, hey man, a little louder, hey, hey man, with the spirit, hey, hey man, hey man, hey, hey man. <laughs> Thank you.
have it up, yeah, I have it down real low. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so it's up to you. Lean away a little. Hey everybody. I just wanted to say hi to those online. Start over. I had it muted. Oh, hello. Hi y'all online. I just wanted to say hey, I don't mean to interrupt. Thank you so much for attending this service. It's really beautiful to have you here from all over. And um, I just wanted to say, Tori, that was so beautiful what you shared about your mom. I'm so grateful that you did that live. Can they? That's okay. Can you hear me? Yes. So, so I just wanted to say, Tori, that I was so grateful for what you said, and I'm really, I'm really glad you felt like you could do that live. It was really beautiful and so moving, and you had us all in tears here in the room, and um, it was such a tribute to your mom. So it was really, really wonderful. Thank you so much. I know it's hard to be far away and over this tech medium and not in the room with us, but it really felt like you were here. So I really am just so grateful. And maybe we'll be in touch a little bit soon. I can't hear you, but I'm just going to say <laughs> thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You want to bring up Zoom in the room? Go ahead, Tori. Talk to the house here. Oh, can you hear me? Hello? We hear you. You can hear me. Yeah, if you want to say anything to Kirsten, she can hear you now. Oh, um, just thank thank you for kind of communicating what the other side was like because it was it is a bit disjointing, isn't it? Um, but no, yeah, it was it was a great service. I'm so glad that you know the tech worked. Um, Max. I, oh, there she is. Right, I'm, I've been, right, I, I need, my, my church view is small. <laughs> I've made it small. Oh, so are you okay? Yeah. Um, you know, thank you guys so very much. Thank you for everything and all the, all the effort, all the work, so much work of the last, what, two months, month and a half? that we've put in and, you know, we, I'm so, so grateful. Thank you for having this space for this service. My mom really wanted that and, hi, Brandy and Diana. <laughs> Brandy. <laughs> oh. Mwah. Oh, no, thank you guys very much. Um, <laughs> I think what we might do is um, have a bit of a chat kind of in the Zoom room. And then I know we've sort of lost um, a few people. I think a lot of people had to go anyway. Um, but Max, I know you asked about the reception video. I, I don't know if we'll need that necessarily. All right, okay, so think. I won't play that. Uh, I'm going to head over to the reception hall then and go ahead and uh, play it over there. Okay. All righty. So I'll touch base with you in soon, okay? <laughs> okay. All right. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna right. to leave the Zoom room then. Okay. You're the host, right? So we shouldn't have any problems. Yeah, that should be fine. Okay. All right. Goodbye, everybody. All right.